no relative, Leslie Ann was well placed to pen the definitive portrait of the Rolling Stones. And here's the book, an absolute must read, The Stone Age. There it is. 60 years of the Rolling Stones. So are they the best band in the world? Are they the greatest band ever? And how have they managed to keep going after all these years? And what is their musical and cultural legacy? All of this and much more is answered in the Stone Age. And I'm delighted to say that Leslie Ann Jones joins me now. Hi, Leslie Ann. How are you? Very well. Congratulations on the publication of the book, Rave Reviews. Thank you. Why did you choose the Stones for this weighty tome? Kind of chose me, really. This 60th anniversary was approaching. I have three young adult children and we talk a lot about music. And it was obvious to me that they knew next to nothing about this band, about the history, about the cast of hundreds, if not thousands, who passed through their lives and careers, who no longer exist in some cases, long forgotten, uh, the many victims, the wives, the children, the girlfriends, the, the people who've fallen by the wayside. And I felt the story needed retelling, bringing back all those people to life. For sure. How did the band come about? Mick and Keith were at school together uh, in Dartford uh, when they were obviously very young, so, so primary school. Brian Jones, meanwhile, emerged from Cheltenham. He was involved in the jazz scene down there. And they gelled in London. Everybody made their way to London to, to make their fortune, if you like, and found each other. And it was very much Brian's band to begin mm. with. Although when they stopped being a covers band, and began to write their own songs, primarily because their second manager, Andrew Lou Goldham, made them. He said, you can't go on recording or playing other people's music forever. And the myth goes that they sh he shot them in a kitchen until they came up with some songs. Brian didn't write. Brian probably felt inhibited by the power of Mick and Keith as songwriters. Mm. They were virtually brothers. And so they were able to bring this chemistry that they had for many, many years into the creation of songs. Well, you saw that, didn't you, in the Beatles documentary, Get Back, where George, and to a greater extent, Ringo, slightly out to sea because the real power dynamic in the Beatles was Lennon and McCartney. So you'd argue it's the same Richards and Jagger. It pretty much is, yeah. Mm. And uh, they, once they understood their power, their songwriting power, there was no stopping them. Mm. And Mick is um, an undersung lyricist, if you like. I think most people don't recognise him for for his ability as a lyricist. Keith is obviously the human riff who would come up with melodies and um, the little tricks of the trade and those things put together make the magic. And what's unique about your book is it's not a sort of blokey rock biography. You mentioned to me before we came on air that you very much wanted to write it, uh, obviously as, a, as an, a very accomplished journalist and biographer, but as a woman as well. And you've, you've sort of written about the sort of the emotional impact of their behaviour over the years. That is always my approach. The vast majority of rock biographies are written by male rock writers who had posters of these guys on the walls when they were kids and wanted to grow up to be them. Uh, my approach is not that. I'm more interested in the psychology of these people, the emotions, the relationships, uh, their children, that kind of thing, because all of that builds the personality behind the rock star, behind the celebrity. Well, to what extent was sex a motivating factor for these young men, particularly Mick? I think rock is sex. It's liberation that we see when we go and watch a band like the Rolling Stones. There's something primeval, something almost bestial that comes out, which the vast majority of people at a rock gig are observing, but they're not behaving that way. But they are witnessing uh, how it could be, what it could be like if they were them up there on stage. Obviously, it's not very much about sex when you're nearly 80, um, which this lineup. You know, they're all pushing 18 now, aren't they? So I think that's sort of not really their agenda. It's more sex and drugs and sausage rolls nowadays. Yeah, it probably is. I mean, Jagger, notorious for his his appetite, sexual appetite over the years. Yeah, and, and reptilian about it. You know, it was all about the pursuit for Mick, that he would chase somebody until she caught him, but then he would quickly lose interest and move on to the next. Um, very disloyal. Uh, not faithful and hasn't honoured his families or the women he's been involved with. He was with Jerry Hall, for example, for 21 years. They had four children together. But once he had a child with somebody else and she said enough's enough, 
he divorced her and it was worse than that because it turned out they were never legally married in the first place. So he turned those four children into bastards overnight, which was a very dishonourable thing to do. So d does he emerge from the book as, as a, a less than nice guy? I would say not very nice, but we have to acknowledge his talent. We have to acknowledge the success of this band, the greatest rock and roll brand in the world, which is what they turned themselves into. The music business changed a great deal in the 80s, largely as a result of Live Aid, because the money men looked and they saw what there was to be made. And it changed, it turned a corner, in much the same way as professional football did. So suddenly it's corporate and suddenly it's all about the juggernaut and it's about the big stadium gigs and it's about massive money, television as well. And that was perfect for the Stones. They didn't need to be in the charts at a certain point. They could just go around the world rocking and rolling for, for decades, which is exactly what's happened. And they reached a point where their music crystallised to the point that we are not used, we're not accustomed to new Rolling Stones music. Mm. They're... they're catalogue, if you like, the songs that we know are ancient. And yet those are the songs they play. You're not going to get very many new numbers at a Stones concert because they're delivering what the audience came to hear, which the same thing if you go to a wedding reception, you know. So they've become a covers band of their own music. They pretty perhaps. much have. Yeah, they're their own tribute band. And there's only two fifths of them left of the original mm. lineup. But you go to a wedding, the DJ comes on, you know, put on Satisfaction, Honky Tonk Women, Brown Sugar and all age groups will get up and dance to their songs. Would you say that the creative well pretty much dried up by the mid-70s? What was, was there a natural cut-off when they... Because I know about Elton John and his particular golden era was sort of 70 to 75, 76. Uh, did they have a particular window? Large swathes of the 80s consisted of Mick and Keith not really talking to each other, which is why they didn't perform together at Live Aid. Mm. They did perform, but Mick was in a... You, probably remember Dancing in the Streets with David Bowie, yes. the video, and then Ronnie and Keith were on stage in Philadelphia with Bob Dylan performing horribly badly, but they weren't together. But some tremendous Stones music came out of the 80s. The downside was that Mick was never able to launch himself yet credibly as a solo artist. Unlike McCartney post-Beatles. Unlike McCartney post-Beatles. And having watched Mac Eric Glasto, which I think pretty much the whole country must have done, either on television or live, I saw into the future and I could see McCartney sanctified by that performance. And the Stones were playing the same night. And they would have been disgruntled because the attention that McCartney got, the adulation, he will go down in history for that one performance at the age of 80. And the Stones can't touch him. Because what, what the, uh, the concert, was it Hyde Park that the Stones yeah. were performing at? And, that, that, and tonight. Uh, 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 there you go. A successful commercial event sold out. Uh, McCartney at Glastonbury, a cultural moment. It was a seminal moment. It was a very moving moment. Because it doesn't matter to him that his voice has declined, that it doesn't have the strength. It's fairly weak now, but he can still hit the notes. Yeah. He'll still get up on the plinth with an acoustic guitar and bash out Blue, uh, Blackbird, in fact, not Bluebird, that's another one of his songs, Blackbird, and then his song, a tribute to John Lennon, which was here today, so moving and had everybody in tears. And I can't remember ever having been in tears watching Mick Jagger live. Uh, you all have watched, uh, you watched the McCartney performance at Glastonbury and he spoke very affectionately about John, uh, who, of course, is a subject of another of your biographies. And, and John would have been very touched by what he had to say. And, and the, I know it was a very troubled relationship they had, but that was a very special moment, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Uh, John, depending on what mood he was in at the time, would have either scoffed at it and shrugged it off, or he would have allowed himself to be moved by it. But he was somebody who couldn't express emotion very well because he was quite stunted from a very young age. Um, the thing he and Paul had primarily in common was they both lost their mothers when they were very young boys. So that bonded them from early on. Um, you can't say the same about Mick and Keith, who both had strong relationships with their mothers uh, in quite a long way into to their adulthood. So they had that, that backbone, if you like. It does make a difference. And what about their enduring popularity? I mean, you said that, you know, sadly, you know, the band is not uh, complete anymore, but they are still, I mean, when people go to see the Stones, they, they say, even now, it's the best gig they've ever 
been to. I mean, they, they are the best live rock band on the planet, aren't they, even today? Yeah, last time I saw them live was in Twickenham in 2018. Um, they'd lost it a bit for me by then. And Charlie Watts, was, of course, was still mm. with him. There is a school of thought now that the Stones without Charlie are not really the Rolling Stones. Mm. There was speculation that they would break up after his sad death, but yeah, it didn't but that's happen. how they've kept going. And and I was asked the other day, what's the secret of their longevity? The secret of their longevity is their longevity. The fact that every time somebody dies, as in the case of Brian Jones, immediately replaced with Mick Taylor. Then Mick Taylor decided to leave, so in comes Ronnie. It's a it's a uh, business. And it a is brand. a business. And Bill Wyman, you know, did he jump or was he pushed? But in comes. Daryl Jones, who's been playing bass with them ever since, and now they have Steve Jordan on drums. So it doesn't particularly matter. And it reminds me of The Who a bit. You've got only two original members of The Who. You've got Pete Townsend and Roger Daltrey, but the others are session musicians. So in which case, we could have The Beatles. Yeah. Theoretically, we could have Paul and Ringo and The Beatles back, but they won't do that because they've moved on and The Stones haven't moved on. It's part of their fascination. Uh, yes, of course it is. And um, obviously, you know, it's it's a, a long history they've had that the famous rivalry with the Beatles. Did it make the Stones better that the Beatles were there? Definitely. Oh, yeah, because Andrew Lou Golden, the manager at the time, saw these fab, cuddly, sweet grandmas, loved them, would have them round for tea, Beatles, and thought, right, we need to be the antithesis to them. And so the Stones will be dishevelled and dirty and bad and they will emphasise sex and they will be um, the boys you would not want your daughter to bring home or go out with. And so they became objects of fascination they, for they were They were edgier, they were cooler, I guess, a bit sexier than the Beatles. So, yeah. Um, also, would you not say that the Stones were better to rock out to than the Beatles? Mm, that's disregarding the fact that McCartney is actually the rock star of the Beatles. I think there's not a lot in it, really, is there? Mick likes to make fun and say, well, the Beatles haven't existed for years. But they have, in everybody's minds. Yeah. Living, living so when we go and see a gig like the Stones or McCartney, we're not actually seeing them as they are now. We're seeing them as they were then. And we're not hearing them as they are now. We're hearing the historical versions. Like when you re-watch a movie for the thousandth exactly. time. Um, and uh, and w what about the emotional carnage uh, in relation to their partners, the wives, the girlfriends, the groupies? I mean, th these women were used, weren't they? In the early days, yes. I think Marianne Faithful, for example, was certainly used. Uh, the angel with big tits, she was known as. And was That's, that used to be my nickname, but... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I know how I you lost feel. lost a bit of weight. But, um, yes, yeah, she was used because of the way she looked. Uh, she did have some musical talent. Anita Pallenberg actually created the Stones. They were a bunch of yobs when she picked them up in Germany, and she styled them and turned them into rock stars. Um, and the fallout for her was terrible late, much later on when she was a bit neglected by Keith living in America and took up with the gardener, Scott Cantrell, 17 years old, and he shot himself in her bed with Keith's gun. My goodness. And um, I think Keith's money got her out of that one. Look, it's the most fascinating read. It's winning rave reviews. What, what surprised you most when you were writing the book? I, you know, all this time I've been worried by the Bill Wyman, Mandy Smith scenario. I hadn't realised to what extent there was underage activity among other people there. Yeah, because, of course, he, he had a relationship with Mandy Smith when she was a young teenager. They eventually married. It was frowned upon at the time, but, of course, now it would get you... Uh, it would get you probably arrested. I don't it? think it was frowned upon. That's the worrying part, looking mm. back, that Mandy was sold as a role model to all young girls everywhere. Wow. And that wasn't an equal relationship. That was child abuse. Yeah. I mean, how old was she when, when, do we know, can we speculate how old she might have been when a relationship began? She says she was 14, but yeah. they met when she was 13. And I know that's true because I was there, but I didn't know how young she was. But I was drawn into that circle. I was handpicked as one of Bill's close circle of friends to disguise the fact that he was having an affair with someone who was underage. And do you, would you say that you don't think that would be an isolated incident for members of, of the Stones? Definitely not. Mm. Young groupies? Yeah. 
Mm, I mean, do you, could there be a day of reckoning, a, a Me Too moment for the band? It's still coming, isn't it? I mean, rock and roll is largely untouched by that. Hollywood has fallen. Mm. Um, R. Kelly has gone to prison. Uh, there are other people in the frame. Uh, Lily Allen has spoken out about experiences that she's had. Mm. It requires somebody to make a formal complaint to the Crown Prosecution Service or to the Met Police. And until people go forward, until evidence is, um, is stacked up, they get away with it. As far as you're concerned, you, you, you couldn't rule out that the Stones were involved in underage sex, you know, in their pomp. None of us could rule that out, no. Mm. Well, look, that's a revelation. There are many revelations in the book, beautifully written, thank and you. I can't wait to finish it. I, I can only thank you for coming in. We love having you on the show, talking about Lennon, David Bowie, Freddie, of course, and now Mick and the boys. Um, congratulations on the release of The Stone Age. 60 years of the Rolling Stones. It's out now.